look at most things in the light of, of as an experiment, just because I think it lessens the sting of failure and kind of positions it as an opportunity for, for learning and for growth rather than like a life or death thing. Welcome to another episode of Right of Your Life, where life happens and life storytelling transforms it. Our show is brought to you by lifestorytelling.com. And guess what? You don't have to be a writer to write your life stories. Lifestorytelling.com will teach you how. If you've been through hell and lived to tell about it, or your family skeletons are poking out of the closet, you'll want to check it out at lifestorytelling.com. Our special guest today is Nick Loper. Nick helps people earn money outside of their day job. He's an author, online entrepreneur, and a lifelong student of the game of business. His latest role is Chief Side Hustler at SideHustleNation.com, a growing community and resource for aspiring and part-time entrepreneurs. Welcome, Nick. Stacy, thanks for having me. Well, I'm really excited to have you on because you have a very interesting life story and you have put it online for all to see. But give us a little bit of, of your background. How, how did you become Chief Side Hustler? Um, I got there by side hustling. I, um, <laughs> I'm a Seattle kid, um, grew up in, in the great Pacific Northwest. And after graduation, I did what you're supposed to do. I got a corporate job, moved across the country, and pretty quickly realized that's not where I wanted to be uh -huh. um, physically or or uh, emotionally or, or whatever. I, I don't know. It just I didn't see myself being the person to climb the corporate ladder. Like That was never a burning desire. And so I tried to figure out, okay, what am I going to do to to get out of here? And and thankfully had started a little bit of working online and websites and affiliate marketing prior to that, which is helping other companies sell their products and services online. And so had a, a little bit of a background and that kind of was the fuel for my first side hustle. My first business was a footwear comparison shopping site. And so that's what I spent my nights and weekends working on for my first few years of, of corporate life before it grew to a point where I was, was finally comfortable to, uh, to give my notice. That's exciting. From there, did you go directly to starting a bunch of different businesses or, or where did you go from there? So what happened on, so, so one of the themes of Side Hustle Nation is like, if you're relying on one source of income, and for most people, that's their day job, that's an inherently risky position to be in. You never know what's going to happen, right? And so the idea of diversification was important to me, except on day one of retirement, I called it my retirement, on day one of self-employment, I was no better off. Like I was relying on one source of income. It was the shoe business. Mm -hmm. And worse than that, it was relying in a very big way on one source of traffic from Google uh, Google ads. And so actually on that first day, and I had, you know, visions of <laughs> hammocks and four hour work weeks <laughs> and, you know, going on hikes with the dog and stuff. Right. But on that day, the website goes down, which is okay. That's temporary. I'll, we'll get it figured out. The tech team will get it figured out. But of all the days, Google has decided that this is the day that they're going to crawl the the website for their quality algorithms. And they say, hey, this site doesn't even load. This oh, is no. garbage. And I'm like, okay, whatever. You know, I'll send them a note when it gets back online. Hey, we're we're back up and running. Would you mind turning my account back on? And they're like, well, on a closer examination, we don't really like your site at all. Like the oh, whole, no. the whole purpose of you existing is to send traffic to other sites, which was true. Like right. our, I needed to send traffic to Zappos, to Amazon, whatever, to get paid on referrals, to get paid on on these shoe sales. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, who are you to judge Google? That's the whole purpose of Google. For example, you search for something on Google, they send you to another site, but they didn't right. see it that way. It was three months of you know, trying to get back into their good graces, making uh, investments and tweaks and adjustments to the to the landing pages, to the different components of the site to make it look like it was more you to be something that fell within their approved guidelines. 
And it's a very, very stressful summer, but it kind of instilled that idea of uh, diversification. And so it was a few years in the making after that until I started the next, the next project and the next project. And that's really accelerated with the Side Hustle Nation blog and the Side Hustle Show podcast. Because now I get to talk to all these awesome people who are, are doing a ton of different crazy side businesses. And it's a little bit of the chasing whatever shiny object is the latest thing but it's really cool to be able to hear such a a diverse array of experiences and also be able to test those out and put them all under that umbrella and report back on the results what worked what didn't work and what my results have been for all these different businesses right that's very cool and so what I always tell folks is that life story doesn't always mean the formal writing a memoir or writing anthology of your life, starting from I was born. It also means telling a portion of your story. And it could be a personal essay. It could be a poem. We've heard those. And for you, writing about your life, you're exposing your side hustle and your failures and your successes to the world online through through blogging and through podcasting. So that's really interesting for us to see and have an entree into your life. And I really enjoy that. What's that been like for you? Well, the Side Hustle blog has been up for the past two years. But what a lot of people don't realize is I've actually been blogging since 2009 and have over a thousand posts at this point. And when it started, it was much more uh, a personal blog. In fact, it was on nickloper.com. And all of those posts are still are still there. If you dig deep enough into the archives, you can still mm-hmm. find them. And and so that was a much more personal story and just whatever random things that come into my head trying to come up with something to write about. And you can watch the writing improve over the course of now six <laughs> years of doing it. Like that's a long time. And it's a really cool it's a really cool practice because you know, you write a lot in school and then you get out and you stop. And For me, that was always, like, as a kid, my mom used to be like, oh, you would be the kid who would, like, write a story. (laughs) Like, go go play outside. No, I'm just going to, I'm going to write a story. And it's like a weird, I don't know, a weird thing to do. You know, having that that outlet even if no nobody was reading it at that time right. we probably had like you know my mom family. yeah my mom my wife and like you know nobody's reading this stuff until i narrowed down the focus onto the you know the part-time business angle and then things started to take off but prior to that nobody was reading it anyways but it was a cool outlet to be able to put your thoughts down on paper even if it's just sharing something of your vacation, sharing pictures of your dog, sharing, you know, sometimes it was, uh, you know, a little bit of the marketing and entrepreneurship stuff because that's what was going on right. in my life. But it wasn't, you know, any deep seated, I, I don't know, confessions <laughs> or, any, or anything like that. And then it eventually grew as you narrowed down your niche to side hustle or side businesses and you gained a lot of followers through that. Mm-hmm. At what point did that start taking off? So that's, I I made the transition like in May, June of 2013. Mm -hmm. And it's been, it's been a very slow and steady growth. I I wouldn't say that's like turning on a faucet and all of a sudden the world is beating down a path to your door. There's still some time involved to grow that and it continues to grow and it's been fun. One of the advantages of that, you know, was there is some built in traffic. Like there was, you know, an archive of probably 800 posts that were crawled and were indexed in Google. And so people, it, it had a little bit of an advantage in, at least in terms of search traffic, that a lot of brand new sites don't have. As traffic increased and you were still sharing some personal things about successes or failures, were you ever hesitant about putting, let's say, a failure online or putting something that, that might be construed as negative about yourself? I think that's important to do actually because it kind of humanizes you like if you if you only publish the True. you know life is great kind of things that's boring <laughs> it, 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 it is i mean everyone loves to read the success stories and that has to be a part of like if you if you're just especially in my line of work like if i was constantly failing it wouldn't make for a very good blog it would be right. like why why am i following this guy he doesn't know what he's doing <laughs> so i talked about the the painful process of like short selling our house i talked about you know the half dozen different side hustle failures that i probably need to update that post because i'm sure there's been more right. since then things don't always go well i think it's important to to share those i really enjoy that because it's almost as if 
by now, because I know you've tried a lot of different things just to try them to see what, what works and what doesn't, which is pretty neat. It's almost as if you're living your life as an experiment, an open experiment for others to see. Do you see it that way? Well, that's the mentality that I try and approach things with. Um, to, to, cause, cause most of the things are not life threatening. You know, mm -hmm. try something out. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, uh, you know, if I set it up right, I'm still going to have a roof over my head. I'm still going to be able to buy groceries this week. I do try and look at most things as an experiment just because I think it lessens the sting of failure and kind of positions it as a opportunity for learning and for growth rather than like, a life or death thing. I enjoy that. You mentioned that you wrote as a child. What's your earliest memory of that? Our teachers were big on this. Like you know, every day you came <laughs> to school, you had to like write down, you know, and they would have a prompt, which was really helpful. Like, oh, right. what did you do this weekend? What's your favorite sport? Who, who's your favorite athlete? Why do you like them? And even starting at first grade, I thought that was really cool. And then, you know, we did the same thing like in Spanish class in, in high school, which was cool because you had to write it in Spanish. And it was all sorts of fun stuff. Something about that consistency and, you know, getting into that practice, I think is, is pretty helpful. Right. And you said your writing has improved over time and with experience. When was the first moment in time? Was there one point in time where you realized, I'm good at this, I can do this, I can blog, or was it just kind of gradually? It does come gradually. I mean, I was, you know, a good student in school. So I had teachers saying, that I wrote well mm -hmm. and, you know, I had some friends who did happen upon the blog. If I must have posted it randomly on Facebook one time, they must have come upon the blog and, you know, they would compliment on it. No one would ever comment. The only people who would comment, of course, are mom and dad and they, they insist on signing the post, dad. And it's like, well, dude, if you just left it at Steve, no one would have to know that <laughs> it was like, <laughs> you're the only person reading this. One of the coolest moments was when I, I published my first book and with Amazon and with self-publishing, like you can put your work on what's essentially the world's largest store for next to nothing and, you know, all of a sudden reach a, a massive, massive potential audience. And so my first book was written purely as an authority builder, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of pieced together some of the other content that I'd already created, added some more meat to it. And wanted people to think like, oh, if he wrote the book on the subject, he must know what he's talking about. The surprising thing is almost, and I thought people would come to the website um, and go and go buy the book. But right. what's the, the surprising thing is almost nobody does that. Almost all of the sales come from people discovering on their own through Amazon. And I remember getting my first like author royalty check for like forty two dollars and thirty seven cents. And it was, even though it was such a small dollar amount, it was really, really nice. a cool feeling because it was like, I'm it's a professional author. Like people are, yeah, people are paying me for my words. It was really cool. Oh, that's neat. Do you remember opening up that envelope and just looking at well, it? Well, I'm, I'm sure it was a direct deposit, but oh, it was, yeah, it was still cool. Like, you know, get the email <laughs> notification, be like, what did I, what did I make? Oh my gosh. This, that's people bought really my thing neat. on Amazon. That's neat. And now you've written quite a few books since then. So what are you up to now? Um, I think five or six, five or on, six. Okay. on Amazon now. And it's an addicting platform because, you know, you'll, you'll reach more people than you ever will on your on your own blog just because it's a top five or top 10 site in the country in terms right. of raw web traffic. And more important than that, it, it's a search engine in itself. And it's a search engine of buyers. You know, Google, people are often looking for information for free. Amazon, people are, you know, they've got their credit card account like already saved and Connected. tied in. Right. And with Kindle, it's like one click orders. And it's a it's a cool uh, platform on that sense. And I'm not saying to set any bestseller records or anything, but it's been a fun, been a fun side hustle. And I've met some really cool people through the different author groups and, and stuff that I've been a part of the last couple of years. That's pretty neat. And then let me ask you about your podcast. When did you start your podcast? Around the same time of the transition to Side Hustle Nation, so around May or June of 2013. Okay, 2013. That's a little bit different way of telling your life story. You verbally tell it. So have you grown in telling your story that way as well? It's definitely made me a more comfortable speaker. And it's primarily an interview-based show, so it's not, you know, I'm not the focus of the show. 
but it's there's some something to be said for the comfort behind the mic. And actually, when I submitted a speaking proposal for a local TEDx event, and they're like, "Well, do you have any public speaking experience?" And I had to be like, "No, but I have a podcast." <laughs> but I have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> they ended up accepting my thing, so it must account for something. Yeah. A very cool medium, and itself. that's actually been the primary growth driver, rather than the written content on the site. Your TED video or your or the podcast? The so podcast. The podcast. Been. Okay. Right. Yeah, the podcast has been a, a tremendous marketing channel for all the rest of the content. So what do you write with or on? Are you a computer-based person or do you do everything online that you write? What's uh, your writing habit? I compose primarily in WordPress or Google Docs. If I'm, if I'm online, if I'm offline, uh, just Microsoft Word. Okay. Like one of my most productive writing times is on airplanes. Like when I'm trapped in this tiny little seat with no internet uh. and I can't move anywhere. I can't get distracted by Facebook and I can just knock out a bunch of writing and I can't do any of my linking or anything like that, but at least I can get the draft written and then go back and clean it up right. later. And so that's been a little productivity hack <laughs> for yeah. on a couple of plane trips so far this year. I've done that too, where you can you turn on airplane mode and then you can just rock and roll with some of that stuff and then finesse it later. Yeah, it definitely helps. Get offline. <laughs> <laughs> So, Nick, what is your biggest strength as a writer? The the persistence to keep doing it, even if not very You're many people prolific. read it. Pretty prolific, like you said, you do it frequently. You know. Yeah, it's a it's a practice. Like it's a daily, well, not daily. I tried to make it daily, but and actually in 2014 had the goal of putting down 500 words a day, which ended up looking a little bit spotty. It was 4,000 words some days and zero for the next week, mm-hmm. but it it averaged out. And, and that was a really cool practice. And I've been really slacking on the tracking of it this year. But if that's something that you're, that you're interested in, because, you know, this is like a Peter Drucker, you know, what, what gets measured gets managed. Right. And if you have that tracker accountability to say like, oh, did I get my 500 words in today? It doesn't matter about what. And I mean, there's a bunch of different sites you can go to for different prompts. I think that's, um, it's, it's something that, like any skill, like if you if you work at it, you're going to improve at it. Right. Do you have a particular writing philosophy that you espouse? Well, if you look at some of my earlier posts, they definitely are more traditional, like longer form paragraphs, and that's transitioned to much shorter form paragraphs. It's essentially writing for the internet, you know, with you're taking white space into account, you know, readability into account. People are scrolling oftentimes on their phone. And so if they come across like a giant block of text, it's like, oh my God, I'm not going to read that. One thing, especially on the book front and even on the blog front that started to help lately is outlining the outlining the book or outlining the post, which is something I was adamantly opposed to in high school. Be like, you Uh got to write an outline before you write your essay. (laughs) Like, yeah, that's dumb. I'll just start writing. But especially on the book side, it becomes once you have that outline, the book almost writes itself. Like I was like, it took me 30 years to figure this out. But you know, now it's kind of like a game. It's kind of like filling in the blanks. Right. And you don't even have to go in order. I'm like jumping around. Like I'm gonna do this section next. It kind of makes it it makes it a lot of fun. And and my friend Chandler kind of recommends even before you do the outline, just starting with a mind map, like grabbing just a, you know, a sheet of paper, starting in the middle and drawing your little circles and bubbles off of, off of each point, you know, that becomes a chapter that becomes a, you know, a, a subsection and all like using that method or using the outline method has been has really accelerated some of the writing, or made it less stressful, I would say, because it's like, well, I already know what's coming next, and you can always move it around, but that's been helpful for me. Well, I like that because then if you have, let's say, just half an hour, a spare half hour to write, you can go to that outline, just pick one, and write for half an hour on that particular subject or piece of it. And that takes some of the stressful thinking out of sitting down, there's a big blank piece of paper there, a blank computer screen. Definitely, definitely. If your to-do list item says, write book, which mine actually did literally at one point, <laughs> like that's a really bad no. uh, to-do item. But if it's like outline chapter one or write subsection XYZ, like oh, all of a sudden I can knock that out. Right. It, that makes it easier. So Nick, what's one thing that has you excited about your writing or your business in general right now? Well, we touched on the podcast. That's been a really cool avenue. And one thing that I'm working on this year is repurposing some of that audio content into written form, into book form. Ah. 
and creating a, a series, like a side hustle series on, uh, on Amazon to reach uh, hopefully more people through, uh, through that medium. I go in spurts, like of having a bunch of prompts and ideas. And a lot of that is when you have downtime or when you kind of get out of your traditional routine. I find like I get more ideas while I'm traveling or while I'm, you know, working someplace other than my home office. And I kind of write down those and I keep all my prompts or all my title ideas in, in a Google Docs sheet or in my like little phone notes app if I'm not if I'm not online. And then when I'm when I am staring at that blank cursor wondering what to write about, I've got a list of half a dozen different ideas to go with. And so <laughs> rather than being up against the deadline and freaked out about what it's going to be, at least have some some idea of what to what to put down. Exactly. I use Trello like that. Okay. Because it's, it can be on my computer and phone and tablet. And, and so wherever it is, I can pick up exactly where I left off and I have the different projects that I'm working on on there. Well, Nick, this has been fabulous information. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? One last uh, tip or hack or tool that I use is called the Hemingway app. And we'll link that up in the show notes as well, where you can paste in your content and it's going to highlight different areas to improve your writing, to make things easier to read. And it's, it goes, goes through the Hemingway style of short, punchy sentences right, and, right. and stuff like that. But it's, it's kind of cool. Sometimes I paste my emails into there and be like, okay, that, yeah, I could have worded that a little bit better. So oh, a cool, cool. another cool tool to check out. We'll definitely put that in the show notes. Well, Nick, thank you so much for being generous with your time and your expertise. Where can our listeners connect with you at? Stop on by SideHustleNation.com and don't dig too deep in the archives because there's a lot of posts back there. (laughs) Excellent. Thank you, Nick. Much appreciated. Great information from Side Hustler Nick Loper. At the end of each episode, I peek into the Life Story Toolkit and share information on one particular tool that you might consider using if you're writing or would like to start writing about your life. The Life Story Toolkit is sponsored by LifeStorytelling.com, where you can find your life theme, discover where to start writing, and craft your life into a compelling story. This episode's Life Story Toolkit features a web app called Pro Writing Aid. This software has a basic package that's free and helps improve your writing by finding overused words, cliches, repeated words or phrases, and also uncovers diction problems like vague language and redundancies. There's even a plagiarism checker. You can use it with Microsoft Word or Google Docs, and there's a Chrome extension as well. The premium version is just $35 a year, and really that's the one you need. The software is at ProWritingAid.com and can probably cut your editing time in half. Well, that's all we have for today. In the last episode, Norma Yeager talked about being the first woman allowed on the New York Stock Exchange floor. What she told those men is priceless. If you've ever experienced being in a place where you weren't wanted, you really should go back and have a listen. Next week, we'll interview the creator of the 92nd Newberry Film Festival, who thinks that irresponsibility is a virtue. If you like this podcast and find it valuable, would you consider sponsoring the show? You can support it by sharing each episode on your social networks, and you can head over to our special page at patreon.com slash right of your life and become a patron. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash right of your life. Not only will you feel good knowing you're helping the show, but there are special perks for supporters. If just 15 people provided $5 per episode, it would help us reach many more people who could benefit from writing about their lives. We love our listeners and would enjoy interacting with you on social media. We're on Pinterest, Facebook, and just about anywhere you can hold a great virtual conversation. My handle is Right of Your Life. This show is put together by consulting producer Nick Jaworski at podcastmonster.com and myself, Stacy Curtis. We hope that today you have the right of your life.